Thank you very much for tuning in. This video is going to be about Quibi. So Quibi was a streaming service. Their idea was to go mobile first, to have a streaming service that is only for mobile and to prepare really high quality premium content. So the reason I want to look at that company is because they went into the market with a fully fledged, extremely expensive, they raised a billion in financing, went to market and it just didn't work out. People didn't subscribe, the business model didn't work, the product looked amazing amazing, but it didn't really have the traction. So what I find interesting is that this is kind of the perfect example of a very poor product market fit. So you always want to make sure that you have a really good product market fit. Even if you look at the backstory of Airbnb or the backstory of YouTube, they didn't start out in the way they look now. If, for example, a company like Twitter had raised a billion in financing and they would have tried to build the Twitter they would have imagined, then this would have probably failed because they needed this seed stage where they figured out where the design desire of the customers is. Where does their product fit into the market and how do we change the marketing but also the product itself to get there. So what they did and I'm actually quite surprised that this even happened. What they did is they created a really expensive product because what they had to do they had Hollywood level filmmaking. They wanted to have a really beautifully designed app. They had all these commercial partners so they lined up everything before they even launched properly. Okay let's get into this deck. This is not the Quibi deck. This is actually from a company I think this is them here Three Vision. So they actually were the ones who prepared this. I couldn't find the pitch deck. There apparently was one. I would have loved to see it, but I guess this one will have to do. So basically founded by Jeffrey Katzenberg and the CEO was someone named Mac, whatever. So founded by Jeffrey Katzenberg. So he was involved with DreamWorks and you can already see there's a very strong Hollywood, high quality content background. So they didn't really have the tech background. They are not in the world of streaming, social media, what do users engage with. They come from the the content background which kind of now makes sense that they actually created a complete finished solution just hope that people watch it or people pay for it if they had a really strong tech background it would have probably looked differently but let's see so here's the idea premium short form mobile first this is important because they thought that we don't even need to bother with screens like with with tv screens they actually right from the beginning said we just want to do mobile really high quality content on mobile actually now that i think about it how many people have a broken screen so i don't even know how much it makes sense to go just mobile with really high quality content how many people just have a, a limited bandwidth just have like a mobile plan i don't know like one gigabyte a month and they can't really watch stuff okay and this is kind of the biggest thing because now you see how expensive the products would be they would invest at least 100k per minute for their footage if you compare this with youtube they have like 500 hours of content are being uploaded per minute on youtube obviously all free because people just upload just like myself you just upload stuff this is kind of like a pyramid so at the bottom you have the really poor content but then at the top you have the really really high quality good stuff but for youtube it's all free they just share the advertiser revenue and they have of course the whole infrastructure so they have to host all of that data and take care of that but other than that it's free but quibi plan was to pay 100k per minute before the customer even buys it meaning that they have to create a portfolio before they even launch the app so you can see why they raised a billion here we go so they basically raised 1 billion and what's interesting the investors are very much all of these studios obviously i mean goldman sachs jp morgan but let's say here disney 21st century fox warner media so you have all these media companies and it's kind of funny because you can see how desperate these companies are to find a sales channel because their sales channel used to be let's say dvd blu-ray and cinemas these were their sales channels if they invest in a really expensive movie then this is where they get the money back and obviously you have merchandise and stuff like that but then obviously streaming destroyed all of that just in the same way in which spotify doesn't pay that much to most of their musicians or most of the artists in the same way the streaming service they're not going to pay that much for for the for most movies there's going to be exceptions if they're really popular but they are desperate to find sales channels and maybe they thought that this would be an interesting thing so they can kind of democratize the market for the media companies not media companies as in news but media companies as in the producers of the content so yeah which is disney i mean they have disney plus they had a very specific target you can see how they would pitch it they have very precise market figures they actually switch it around it says 18 to 35 but i think later on they say 25 to 35 and i've also heard 28 to 35 so i kind of slimmed it down more and more and more which is i guess very telling yeah they had really outlined their scenarios so 
they were going pretty bold. They had three cases. The number one would have been the lower case and then middle case and upper case. They fell very, very short of the first one. But obviously the pandemic also happened, but they fell really short of this because people didn't want to buy it. They didn't even have a real freemium model. They launched it for free for a while, but they didn't really allow them to just have like a freemium version where it's free with ads or stuff like that. And then if you want to pay like YouTube, then you can pay without the ads. But they actually had an ad version with a subscription price. So you would have to pay five bucks a month even to get the version which had ads. And if you wanted to have the version without ads, you have to pay a little more. So yeah, th this was their business model. Yeah, Leonardo DiCaprio, also the redhead from Game of Thrones. They also had her. They definitely had some really interesting talent. They had really high level producers and really high level actors. So I'm sure the content was amazing. It was very expensive and people didn't want to pay for it on their mobile, but the content for sure was amazing. And here, if you look at the cons, by the way, this was before the company really launched and shut down. So everything you see here by this company, 3Vision, they basically analyzed them and checked, okay, does this make sense? What are the pros and cons? So is this gonna work? So they kind of left it, yeah, pretty much open. This is just like a marketing analysis here. All right, let's go into the interview. So I just want to give a very brief introduction. I think it was a little longer than it was intended to be. Let's Let's go into the interview and see how they talked about the company before it launched because I find it very telling the way they describe it. All right, this is going to be the origin story of why these two people, which is him, the founder, and then also the CEO, why they had this idea for this company or for this technology. When I had this idea for Quibi uh, now almost exactly two years ago, it came across the ticker that Meg was stepping down. And she had told me that she was kind of getting at the end of it. I didn't know when. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure within about two minutes of uh, coming across the ticker, she was st stepping down. I called her up. I said, hey, what are you doing, Meg? And she said, oh, you know, Griff and I, we're going to go travel and go to the ranch and all that. I said, no, no, no. What are you doing tonight? <laughs> and she said, well, knowing you, I guess we're probably having dinner, aren't we? And I went, yes, we are. <laughs> and I got on a plane, I flew up north, and I sort of shared this idea, a very, very loose kind of excuse of a business plan. And uh, we spent three and a half hours together. And at the end of it, she said, hmm. She likes to say, hmm. <laughs> and uh, and uh, she said, uh, this is a really good idea. And um, I think maybe we should do it. So first of all, how is this not grandpa and grandma having an app idea? Just if you look at that and you look at how they communicate the idea, they don't seem like startup founders. They don't seem like the people who have like this crazy new idea and they have traction and everything is great and they raise money. They seem like they had a lot of money at their disposal, including all the investors. They're really good at convincing people and they just had an idea and they just wanted to try it. Here we are. And so at that moment, the good idea was well, there's Netflix, there's Hulu, there's a resurgent film industry, there's Instagram TV, there's YouTube, but somehow we're going to find a space in the middle. I love that. <laughs> so the guy, it's so funny because it's the obvious thing. It's one thing if there were no streaming services and they would launch this, obviously this would be great. If there was just YouTube, and this is the first paid streaming service, then even I would still say that, oh, this is gonna be tough because YouTube also has like paid content and stuff like that. But since there is no real library type thing, like something like Netflix or Amazon Prime or Hulu or whatever, then I would still say, okay, there's a chance. But we have a ridiculous amount of streaming services. There are so many, I can't even list them all. There's a lot. And I like the interview because as you will see, all of the people who interview them, they're all kind of concerned. They're all kind of saying, are you sure about this? Are you sure that there's actually a market for this? Are people actually going to pay for this? And the answer is always going to be like the vision. Yes, we want to be the new thing. We want to be the next generation of streaming. Right? Well, uh, the idea is actually very high quality short form video for mobile um, and in a, a day part. OK, so he asked a very specific question and the question was the market. There's Hulu, there's Netflix, and you think this is a good idea. His question was the market and she goes to the idea. And this is exactly the point. She's not really addressing the question about the market. She's kind of going back to the idea and trying to convince him, probably like they convince investors. Use of seven in the morning till seven at night. But actually the bigger idea, there's a long history of technology. In he didn't ask for the idea. He asked for the market, which is very crowded. 
enabling new ways to tell stories. And that's what I saw. I said, if we can bring the best of Hollywood and the best of Silicon Valley and create a technology platform that allows the creators that Jeffrey has worked with for 40 years, we can create something extraordinary. Okay, now you can see the sales pitch to the investors. A lot of the investors were studios or people involved in Hollywood or involved in this industry, except for obviously the other ones, which are just financial companies, which probably weren't the first investors. I think the first investors probably were the studios and so on. As soon as she had a question about the market, she goes to how about we bring in the Hollywood talent, which is like if you're a Hollywood company, you're yes, please bring me in. That's exactly what you want. She didn't really answer the question, but she answered in a way that investors would like which is why they raised one billion. And you have to remember, this phone was never designed to watch video on it. Stop. This phone was never designed to watch video on it. That's exactly what it was designed for. If you look at the original phones, they had like small screens, like really small, you couldn't do anything. Then we had the touchscreen and then the whole phone got bigger. But once the phone got bigger, we used the display mainly for photos, for video. We didn't need a big display like this to just to navigate. Navigation was fine. Like this wasn't that much of an issue. But watching videos was horrible and all of this stuff. I would say that if you look at the phone the way it is now, obviously the touchscreen so it's more intuitive but I think photo and video and media content are one of the main drivers why they look like that I remember the first iPods where you can actually have photos so for example you have the photo of the album you're listening to this is kind of a new thing as soon as we could we added these things and I really like that because you can kind of see images you could argue that but I would say phones are designed for photo and video they're maybe not designed exactly for our eyes because our eyes would prefer the other aspect ratio but they're definitely designed to watch media on them. This is like one of the main things we do with them. Right? It was designed to make phone calls, to take still pictures, to text, other things. Stop. This doesn't make any sense. So this is where they came from, but they have developed into something that is very much designed for media. So right there, this doesn't make any sense. And she's holding it like a grandma who has just discovered the phone and now she explains it to the other grand people grand people to the other seniors oh this phone hasn't been designed for that because no one's gonna call her up because nobody knows anything about phones but they should know better like this doesn't really make sense and i said i think there's a way to make a technology platform that will make watching video extraordinary on this device creating a whole new generation of filmed entertainment okay with her logic why did she not reinvent phones. She is saying that phones weren't designed for watching videos and her solution is to create videos that work on something that is not designed for videos. This doesn't make any sense. What would make sense for her is to say, okay, we have one billion in financing, let's develop a new type of phone because this is developed for that or you have a handheld video device just for watching, just like a screen and however you imagine it to be perfect. Maybe like glasses with a screen, I don't know. But she says phones are not designed for video. Our solution is to create videos video that works on something that's not designed for it. Makes no sense, but let's go on. All right, let's talk about the pain points. What are the worst things about watching video on a phone? Because there's a lot. Let's get into that. Uh, well, listen, I mean, it's, it's not a horrible experience, but we think it can be a lot better. So first is think about um, portrait to landscape. Um, most companies have either decided they're going to do things in portrait or landscape, but they don't have the ability to go back and forth between portrait and landscape in full screen video. Stop. If I listen to that and I know, okay, there is a company that is doing that. So if I watch something, let's say I watch YouTube. I don't really watch Netflix and stuff like that, but I watch a lot of YouTube. If I watch YouTube and then how many times would I want to switch? I can switch all the time. Yes, as soon as I switch, I have less less of space. So, so the screen, the aspect ratio doesn't fit. But I don't mind at all because if I watch a video, I'm not switching. I'm just, usually it's my tablet. I just have the tablet there and then I have a YouTube video. I decide that I'm probably going to do the landscape view and this is what I'm going to do. Why would I need to switch multiple times while watching a video? Because I'm walking. But if I'm walking, I'm not going to pay attention to the video. So why do I need high quality content if I'm walking? Or is the benefit that I can experience that in two different ways and I just leave it? But then you can just have content that's optimized for vertical or optimized for landscape. You don't need both. You can just choose. You can say, okay, when I'm in the train, I want to have the vertical view. If I'm at home, I want to have the horizontal view. Does she have proof or market traction to know that people even like this? Because I would say that this is an interesting feature, but to make this the main benefit and they've 
patented that. They basically patented this. How do they call it? Yeah, but they patented that. So this is really important. This is central to what they do. Premium content and this whatever, flip style, whatever. We've created a technology that allows that to happen. Think about um, the watch. If you were to watch a video in this room right now, you could get the video to look right, but then you go outside into the sunlight and you can't see it. So we have the ability to change the lighting of your video with just your fingers in app. Okay, this is ridiculous. She's changing. <laughs> I can change the lighting on basically everything. Okay, let me not be too mean because let's say she changes the lighting of the scene, which can be different from just increasing lighting. Let's say it's very dark. I just increase the lighting and I still can't see it. Maybe they actually film it in a way where they have information inside the app that actually changes the footage itself. Maybe this is a benefit, but honestly, if I am outside and I'm watching a movie that's really extremely dark, I probably shouldn't watch a movie that's so dark that I can't see it. There's usually, if you have a movie, there's one scene that's very dark, like one or two scenes, but it's not like the whole movie is dark. So you, maybe you can't see it. You just turn it up, the brightness, and then it should be fine. But yeah, so why is she not being called out? I have a feeling that the interviewer should have jumped in just like I did, like multiple times already. Noise, a little, a simple thing. You're watching your video on a bus. It's pretty quiet. And then all of a sudden it gets really loud. You can't hear it. Well, everything on Quibi will be subtitled. Little tap of the button, subtitles come up, noise goes off. And then it's like she has been asleep for years. YouTube has automatic subtitles. Even Premiere Pro, if you're into editing, auto generates subtitles now. There's so many sites that have subtitles. Netflix has subtitles. So far, what she has said is extremely underwhelming. It might impress a group of seniors who don't know phones, but I'm not impressed at all. When you're ready to listen again, you can hear it again. And we've got a whole host of things around um, personalization that you know we've got to work on as well. But those are some of the key ideas. And when here's an interesting thing, and everyone in this audience knows this. When you are an entrepreneur, part of the strategy is the art of exclusion. And we made a decision very early on that this was going to be the... She's talking about limitation, just like Twitter is limiting themselves to whatever, 140, 280 characters. So just in the same way, you have a limitation there. She's saying, oh, we limit ourselves to mobile, but I don't see the creativity. So far, she has limited herself to mobile and she has reinvented the wheel. What she has done is she added subtitles. You can switch around, you can change the brightness and that's pretty much it. And you have high quality content. All of that we already kind of have. And all of that we already have in every single app. You can switch around YouTube, you can switch run all of these you can change that you might have a different aspect ratio but this is so far the only innovation that i see but i don't think it's going to carry i mean this is a post-mortem already done so it's really good to look back and be smart but even at that point i think you could have seen that i would actually really like to look at a company that is pre-launch just to analyze it and then see if you can predict that that would be really interesting yeah if you have any recommendations send me the link for you suspect that they don't have a product market fit or this is not going to work or they just make some obvious errors so there might be a fraud. The only screen that we were going to develop for. And so every bit of our storytelling, every bit of our technology is designed to optimize just one device. And that makes things happen that you wouldn't. <laughs> she looks so smug. She's like so, so happy about that. She, she has said something that's so boring and she's so happy about that. Which... Today, got 10 minutes, read a chapter to got an hour, keep going. So Quibi is actually sort of bringing that same idea with what he's talking about is they actually looked at an author like Dan Brown, who has like very short chapters. If you have a book and you have a chapter that's very, very long, it's kind of difficult to pick it up, read something and put it back down. I mean, obviously you could put in a bookmark, but some authors and Dan Brown is one of the examples actually has very short chapters. So within five minutes, you can read a chapter and then you can just leave it and then you go to the next one and then next day you can read that. So basically the idea is to have these quick bites. This is why it's called Quibi. And he's very proud of that. He actually mentioned that a lot so this whole quick bites thing which is we're making movies movies that were the mainstay of the business when i grew up in it so if you go back into the 60s and 70s and 80s we made people movies um they were big high concept ideas with great actors uh, in them and so those movies are really not that don't really work in movie theaters today we think they are going to be bread and butter for for us second is is actually 
he wants to make movies that don't really work in movie theaters anymore because they're character driven. I don't get that at all. First of all, I wasn't around, I don't know, like the 60s or whatever. But he's saying these are movies from whatever the 60s and they wouldn't work in movie theaters anymore because they're character driven. So all the movies that wouldn't work in the movie theaters anymore would be just really boring or they would have really low quality or they would have really weird acting where they have like this theater type acting, which just doesn't seem real. They're not actually pretending to be someone. They're just playing someone in a very over the top way. But yeah, I would have followed up on that. What do you mean by these are the types of movies that don't work in theaters, but they're going to work on Quibi? Because in his case, he's saying this is the bread and butter, meaning that this is what they want to focus on. I don't really know what he means there. But then again, there's not a criticism of the content because the content probably is pretty good. They use Hollywood writers. So this is all very modern, but I don't know what the 60s thing is about. <clears throat> um, doing really kind of fun things in reality television um, uh, today and, and where we can take this what really we're <laughs> the interviewer oh no the interviewer he, he looks at them he's like leaning it it's so funny it's his face is like he doesn't believe it like what is happening here obviously I'm, I'm i'm just like this is just his face but if you imagine that at this point he's thinking this is never gonna work but i can't say it this is exactly what he would look like take this what really we're sitting here you know youtube is actually the foundation of this and uh the author of this which is um, if you had uh, fantastic resources um, as YouTube uh, storytellers and creators, if you had greater resources, what would the ambition and that you could do with it? And that's what a subscription service allows us to do. Uh okay, so first of all, the amount of content that YouTube has, I said it before, it's 500 hours per minute. If you just look at that, there's gonna be a fraction of that that's gonna be extremely high quality. And that's what we see on YouTube. There are shows on YouTube, but all of the people that are at the top of YouTube, they have really high quality content. It looks really, really good. And if they wanted to make movies, they could make movies. If they're really good at this and they're also filming makers they could get a deal with netflix and whatever and then you watch it on netflix so it's not like this is completely unserved but on the other side and there's kind of a comment to that is that now he's talking about creators but he also wants to bring in the hollywood talent so do you want to have the creators creating their own content and you give them money to do it or do you want to bring the creators in because it sounds like these two are very very different if you want to have the creators come in you need the same funnels as with youtube if you want to have the private creators like the individual people come in then you need a really large user base so you're going into a networking approach like youtube a really large user base of people engaging uploading content and then at the top you have the high quality but he wants to bring hollywood so i don't know exactly how he envisions this mechanism to work uh, and third which i think um maybe end up being most importantly is is that we are going to professionally curate uh information everything you need to know and why it matters into these sort of four to six minute news, sports, weather, horoscope, you, you know, uh, just a, a suite of things in which we are actually going to make gaming, esports. Okay, this is what YouTube is already doing with the algorithm. The algorithm already decides what is being pushed and what isn't. So if there's content that YouTube doesn't like, I'm not gonna mention any keywords, but we all know the stuff that is medical in nature, that is political in nature, that YouTube doesn't want you to push, YouTube doesn't want you to talk about. So they are already doing that. Everything is curated based on likes, based on the algorithm, based on the click-through rate. So this is already happening. What they are saying is they wanna do the same thing, but I guess manually or maybe also an automated way but this is not new and this is the whole point everything they're saying is not really new they just say it as if they were the first people doing it and I believe that the investors think that too because they know the industry it's very similar to Elizabeth Holmes because Elizabeth Holmes got investors who didn't know the industry they didn't know the technology and the industry so they had no idea they didn't understand that the technology wouldn't work in that way or that what she claimed is impossible at that stage and in the same way you can see the investors that they had a lot of movie studios, they don't necessarily understand that all of these things are already there. They might not understand the ins and outs of YouTube. Maybe they're not using YouTube themselves. I don't know. But clearly there's a disconnect between what they think is new and what actually is new. Where it's celebrity, convenient for you on a device in a high quality way and targeted very specifically 25 to 35 year olds. Yeah, now he's put it up 25 to 35. It's getting older. It's in effect, if you think about it, it's what Spotify did for music. Seven, eight years ago, all music was free, all music was available, just type it into, you know, to, to a device and you could get it. So why are there 
250 million people paying $10 a month for music today. So now I'm really going to like the interview question. And so we'll have highly curated news, tier one, you're going to have tier two, sort of high-end YouTube reality TV shows, and then tier three, a new form of movie making. You'll be producing 25 to 30 pieces of content a day? Yeah, over 30 pieces of content a day. So if you think about that, we will publish every day, five days a week, in volume, more hours of content than a broadcast network does in prime time. So quality is essential to what we are doing, and quantity is equally important because we don't have a library. There's also one one billionth of what YouTube produces every day, but lots of high quality stuff. <laughs> this is the first time the interviewer is actually a little cheeky because he says, okay, one billionth of what YouTube is making, which probably probably is even accurate. If you look at 30 pieces of content that are very short and you have 500 hours per minute on YouTube, one billionth is probably, is probably even less than that. Yeah, the interviewer understands that what they're doing doesn't really make sense. But it's once again one of the things where they're not really getting called out. So I think in this particular case, they're not lying, you know? It's not like the Elizabeth Holmes case where she clearly said that what she had was more than what she actually had. So for example, to trick the investors, what she did is they gave the investors a finger prick, tested the blood, and then ran it on conventional machines and then said that this was their technology, which obviously isn't true. So so this is actually lying. If you sit with someone who is lying, then it's very difficult to figure out what is true or not, because you just assume they're telling you the truth. And if they say it works, there's nothing you can say as an interviewer. But if it's all on the table and they're being truthful, like in this case, it's very easy to call them out because you can just say that oh really have you proven the traction like does this make sense so for example the market is extremely crowded have you shown that people appreciate this switching around because you're basing so much on it and when he talks about the movie of the 60s that wouldn't work today okay have you shown that they work on mobile like do you have proof you can always ask this in an interview because even that question is still very friendly you can just have like a friendly engagement here and he's kind of starting to do that by saying okay this is a fraction of what youtube is doing yeah but well but listen you YouTube does phenomenal work. There's the creativity. Listen, we were, you know, treated to, you know, brilliant talent here this morning. It has been in a brilliant ecosystem and one that, frankly, very much allows us to sort of go the next generation. Here's a way to think about that. Now I should shut up here because, well, if you take... If you look at broadcast television. Okay, I'm gonna cut him off. Okay, so now we're gonna go into this tech where they have like this portrait and landscape thing where they switch horizontal and vertical. So now let's see why they say it is important. And obviously they have to mention proof, they have to mention user traction and that user actually want it. This is a product market fit. Unless you are a genius who knows exactly what the market wants, you're guessing. You're guessing that, okay, we build it and then people are going to love it. This is your guess. And it's a pretty big guess. This is a one billion guess. So he's asking, why do you think it's important? When you were running through... <laughs> When you were running through the technological challenges and the technological changes and what you've introduced with Quibi, you mentioned that it will be filmed both in portrait and in landscape, which is a pretty complicated idea. You're not just saying that the, you turn your phone, you'll see the same image. You're saying you'll see a different image and a different story. Explain that. Explain why that's important. So Jeffrey mentioned one thing that should not go unnoticed. We will be the first OTT service to launch without a library. Why do we launch without a library? Because the content needs to be shot in a way that you can seamlessly go from portrait to landscape. Now, some of our content, it's the same narrative, it's the same view, it just looks fantastic in portrait and fantastic in landscape. So the cinematographer... Actually, now she says it's the same narrative and the same view. So you're looking at the footage and it looks the same. It just has a different aspect ratio. I think later on, they're going to actually change that. I think later on, they're going to say it's a different story, but let's see. Needs to look through their camera and say, how is this shot going to look look in vertical or portrait, how's it going to look in landscape? And then what we do is eff effectively make two movies that we have some um, new technology to allow that it doesn't suck up your battery width and it doesn't suck up your, or your battery life and your bandwidth. And it can be two movies that are quite different. Right, it could be well, different it can story also, lines, it could be different characters. Absolutely, because once our creators figured out this portrait to landscape notion, they said, well, I'm gonna tell one story when you see it in. Okay, so she doesn't really answer why she thinks users are gonna like it. So they have a new technology and they put in a lot of money and they let people play with that, but they don't really describe how the user actually engages with that and why they would engage with that. Why would they prefer that? I would find it annoying if I switch it and then suddenly I have a different view because if if you just switch it around, you see different content. This is just how it is. If I have my phone and I take a photo and I do it like this, like this, it still looks different. So let's
let's say you have a room, I can see different parts of the room if I switch it around. You can't change that. You can't be in a position where you actually have the exact same content without ruining the aspect ratio. If you ruin the aspect ratio by just dragging it and then it's basically stretched, then it works. But otherwise, as soon as you switch, you see a different angle. And I would also always think, oh, maybe I should switch it around because maybe I would miss something. For an OCD person like me, it would be really annoying. In landscape, you're going to see one view of the, of the story. And when you see it in portrait, it will be a different view of the same story. So what we have seen so far as Jeffrey has gone out to the creative talent in Hollywood is exactly what we had hoped would be the case, is that we brought a new technology that enabled storytellers to tell their stories in an entirely different way. Okay, so her whole thing is about allowing storytellers to tell the story in a different way, but there's no talk of product market fit. There's no talk, do users like this? Do users want this? What's the most of the betas you've seen? What is the most surprising use of this technology so far? I love this question. He pushes into what is the beta use. So your first customers, the early adopters, the first test group, the beta group, how are they using that? And he's really careful because he's not saying, okay, is this being used at all? He's being really nice about it because he said, what has been the most surprising use? Because he wants to know, is there a use at all? Like, like how are they using it? Because he can't see it for himself. Um, I think how Hollywood has embraced this. To be perfectly frank, I was a bit nervous. Okay, so he's talking about the beta use and her answer is how Hollywood has embraced it. This is completely backwards again. She's not looking at the market, she's looking at the production. So he is asking what has been the most surprising beta use case of this? And she doesn't know. So she goes back to Hollywood loves it. Nobody is doubting that she can put a billion into Hollywood to get content that looks different. Nobody has doubted that. Nobody is doubting that she can have writers create content that can be split up into five minute pieces. Nobody has doubted that. What people have doubted is, and just like the interviewer, is that there is not really a use case for that. The user who's going to pay, they are the ones who are probably not going to use it. So how have you validated that the users who you want to pay are actually using that? And she has us about this because I said, listen, are we going to get the greatest storytellers in Hollywood to actually think about? Yeah, let's skip this. She keeps talking about Hollywood. She's not talking about the users at all, which is a warning sign. If you look at someone and I don't want to highlight other entrepreneurs. But let's say Elon Musk. He right from the beginning said he wants to create a product that users love and he's really focused on having a really good user experience. And I found this with a lot of people who are in this business where you create something that's very complicated, but they always have to be very close to the user. You always have to know what the user wants. You have to not only talk to them, but see how they engage with it. So in this case, she should have jumped on the user experience and why they use this, why they love it and what their feedback is, but she has nothing. About filming their um, movies for us in a different way than they've done for the last two decades. And I said... Okay, let's, let's go forward a little bit. You know, the sort of combination of, you know, five, six, seven years ago, Qualcomm creates a chip that allows us to stream quality video on this. The extraordinary, extraordinary evolution of the largest, most uh, important, uh, most valuable media platform by a factor of 100 called YouTube, right? has now created this amazing new experience. There are two billion people watching a billion hours of content every day. The idea that you could now allow that to migrate into a super premium. The idea that you could replace that or that you could add something that is not covered by that is kind of ridiculous. So their whole premise is that you're watching video, let's say from 7 to 7, like 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And they're looking at people who are 25 to 35. So in that segment, guess what those people are doing? They already have Instagram, Facebook and YouTube, whatever, Twitter, Periscope, I don't know, Netflix. They have all these apps on their phone already. If you go to YouTube and you watch a video and you stop watching it because you have to leave the train or whatever guess what youtube is doing youtube automatically adds a bookmark so if you want to keep watching exactly where you left off you can already do that in youtube so basically if you look at the market they're trying to capture it's already occupied this is not an empty market and yet they are selling it in a way as if nobody was currently occupying this market segment the idea that you could now allow that to migrate into a super premium version of, of that. Okay, what he just said, he's talking about YouTube and now he says that they want to migrate in a super premium version of that. If you think about it, YouTube is already a premium version of YouTube. 
and YouTube is also a low quality version of YouTube because everybody's on YouTube. If you want to have really low quality content, then you just look for the really, really small creators. If you want to have really high quality content, you just look for the really, really big creators. If you want to have a movie, you go on Netflix. If you want to have a movie, you can buy it on YouTube or on Amazon Prime or Hulu or whatever. So for him to look at YouTube and say, we want to have a high quality version of that. Why isn't anyone screaming and saying that, man, you should look at the really high quality content on YouTube. There's some really good stuff. I just recently saw a video where it's like a lot of creators that are really, really big. They're trying to look smaller by trying to have like this at home feel and they have like a studio and basically have like a home in the studio so just having a, like, this at home feel they have the opposite problem the really top ones are too high quality they're trying to be a little more relatable so for him to say they want to have really premium version of youtube is is i think really exciting it's exciting to hollywood they they you know this it's exciting to hollywood who are the investors obviously they're excited but they don't understand i guess so i don't want to say they don't understand the market but clearly they're not as involved in the market as a tech company would be a tech company especially a streaming company if they had asked any company that is in tech and not in streaming yet and do they want to go in i think they would have had a much harder time i'm actually surprised at disney because disney has disney plus so for them to go in i guess they thought this is just another distribution channel so i guess they thought okay why not it could work maybe they just believe the hype but they would actually be the ones that should have called them out because they had disney plus they should have known how tough it is but yeah okay let's go on things first is we are making sure that our company reflects our audience one of our core values is be the audience. So think about this. Our company is 50%, 51% women, 49% uh, male. The company is 51% women and 49% men, which is perfectly fine. But the fact that she knows this tells me that they were hiring particular for that, which is kind of weird. So you want to hire the best talent. And if it's 60% women, let's say you have a writer's team and they're mostly guys, but then let's say you have a design team and they're mostly women. Why would you try to have any margins? Why wouldn't you just let it be the way it would naturally be? Why would you do that? So they are not the only company that's going for diversity, but for a startup, and even though they've raised 1 billion, they're still a startup because it's still very new. I think a startup should never worry about political things like diversity. They should make sure that they have all the skills they need. And once they have a certain traction, they have the luxury of taking care of things like diversity if they have to improve their ESG score. I don't like it particularly I don't like all of this diversity stuff and so on, but I understand that big companies have to comply with that. It just impacts the way advertisers deal with you, partners deal with you. If they see you have a low score, then they might not deal with you at all. So they kind of have to comply. This is just a society we set up. But for a startup to already focus on that, I think that's pretty fishy. 43% of our leadership team is women. 47% of our employees identify as non-white, which is... Okay, they identify as non-white. So 49% are men, 51% are women and whatever 47 percent identify as non-white so are they non-white or not this is a weird thing so we have this whole thing about identifying as a man and woman i get that to some degree but let's say i identify as non-white this seems a little more black and white no pun intended but here's the thing that is so ironic about their diversity they have this super diverse team right they have like men and women and stuff like that but their founders are not reflecting the target group that target group are 25 to 35 they've said it multiple times 25 to 35 relatively young and they are both over 50 look at them i don't want to be mean because they look over 60 for sure but let's say they're over 50 how can they have such a focus oh this is our audience this is our company and the founders themselves the one who created the idea they are not the target group they don't understand the target group you can focus on diversity as much as you want if at the core of what you're doing you're not actually reflecting your target group i think you have to reflect on what you're doing all right i don't want to make the video too long i don't want to drag on too much i hope this was entertaining i'm actually gonna have a few more videos on them because every single interview with them i saw and there's one after they closed down which is kind of funny so all the interviews of them that i saw it was just i was thinking how how could no one press them more this would be so interesting i would love to just ask a few questions like really understand it could this have worked 
yes, for sure, this could have worked. I think if they had changed their strategy a little bit, and if they had just said, instead of creating the complete product and putting so much money into all of the production and so on, let's have more tests. Really, let's let's try to figure out who is our audience, what do they care about? And if we see that any of our assumptions is wrong, like this whole flip whatever thing, if any of our assumption is wrong, then we change the product. I think what they didn't do enough is changing the product. And they put themselves in a position where they couldn't change the product because they spent all of their money already. So they were in a position where they just want to put the rest of their money into marketing and that was it. But they didn't really have that much money left to really change the product. They should have finished the product before they launched it. And they couldn't finish the product if they hadn't really proven the willingness to pay the product market fit and all of that. So could it have worked? For sure. If they had left room to change the product to fit the market. All right. Thank you very much for watching. I hope it was entertaining and see you on the next one.